and we are live. Greetings and salutations at Beautiful Beans and welcome to a very special World Anvil interview because I have the amazing Dimitra here today. Dimitra, how are you doing? I'm fine. It's lovely to meet everyone. It's great to be in this company. Well, we're really excited to have you here today because not only is Tolkien, of course, the flavor of the day yet again with the new Tolkien series coming out, but we ourselves are running the History Challenge uh, on the Shoulders of Giants Challenge, where we have asked you guys to create historical cultures in your world uh, with a view to weaving them into your current action. And that is exactly what Tolkien used to do. So we're going to be talking about that as well as a variety of other exciting things. Of course, you can ask questions. Make sure you throw those into the chat and we will be getting to those in ooh, about 30 minutes or so. Let's see. I should introduce you properly, Dimitra. What do you think? Dr. Dimitra Fimi is a senior lecturer in fantasy and children's literature and co-director of the Center of Fantasy and the Fantastic, the Fantastic, I love that, at the University of Glasgow, UK. She has published award-winning monographs on J.R.R. Tolkien, and Celtic inspired uh, children's fantasy and co edited Tolkien's manuscripts on invented languages. I have already been talking with Dimitra about potentially getting her back for even more talks, potentially also about invented languages. <laughs> so I'm very, very excited about that. But let's let's kick straight off because my goodness, Tolkien, such a big subject. Let's talk about where Tolkien came from, because I always think when you're looking at the past, one of the most important things is to understand the context surrounding the people who are creating the things. So tell us about Tolkien's real world, the world he was born into. How did that world shape his fictional world and his creativity? Yeah, it's a very good question and one that uh, gets misunderstood quite a lot. We tend to think about Tolkien as a 20th century writer, but of course he's born in the late Victorian period. You know, he's really a late Victorian child and with an Edwardian um, upbringing. And then by the time he's publishing The Lord of the Rings, he's a middle-aged man, really, uh, which is, again, you know, unusual. Um, so this is somebody who has been born um, in, the, in, the, in the last couple of decades of the 19th century, really. Um, he has gone through uh, the First World War, which was an absolutely crucial um, part of his experience. Um, he has become an academic, he has a young family, he goes through the Second World War where his children are now sent to, sent to war. And at, 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 in the midst of all of that Second War, he's writing The Lord of the Rings. So when we're thinking about his you know, mess, best known works, um, they have a long history behind them. And also he's been writing stories uh, of Middle Earth for decades before we see The Lord of the Rings. So elements of um, Victorian culture that you see in his world, world, uh, works, for example, is this fascination with elves, for one thing. So we think about um, we think about elves today as a standard of fantasy, right? But back at the back in the nineteenth century, we're talking about fairies mostly, and we're talking about fairies in the traditional sort of diminutive, winged, you know, whim slightly more whimsical uh, representation that you see in texts like Peter Pan, you know, the beginning of the twentieth century. Um, and Tolkien's first uh, iteration of the elves, well, they are fairies. They are very small. They are, you know, they do have wings, if you see his early poems, for example. And then when we end up with the first versions of the Silmarillion and the Book of Lost Tales, they are also quite whimsical with flowering language and their size is variable at times. So the fact that we have a whole mythology in which the elves are central rather than the human beings or the gods for example, I think that comes straight out of Victorian culture, that preoccupation uh, with fairies. Um, I could talk about all sorts of other things like racial anthropology, for example, the way that people were thinking anthropologically about the human cultures at the time. There's a lot of that that feeds into Middle Earth later on. Um, the, the way that the Shire is represented, the Shire is, uh, he said a number of times, you know, it's, it's a Warwickshire village around the time of the Diamond Jubilee. And that Jubilee is not, you know, the late uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth II's Jubilee, it is Queen Victoria's Jubilee, uh, which, you know, Tolkien was around. He remembers the, you know, he remembers, he remembered the fireworks uh, from, from that. And you see all of that in the Shire, for example. So that mater the materiality of the Shire is very much a late 19th century sort of, you yeah. know, um, um, mid middle England village. Yeah, it's fascinating to hear that 
Tolkien, like many of us, definitely, you know, iterated and reiterated his early concepts of, of these species that he was creating of, of parts of the world. Sure. Uh, really interesting. Uh, Tolkien is often called the father of fantasy or even the grandfather of fantasy at this point. Was he the first fantasy writer or were there others before him? Nowhere near. <laughs> it really it really depends how you define fantasy, right? Um, uh, there are two schools of thought really here. One school of thought is that um, fantasy has always existed. And it goes back to mythological texts. It goes back to Gilgamesh. It goes back to the Odyssey and the Arthurian legend, you know, all the way to. So it's just that we, call, we, could, we called it something else back then. And realism hadn't, you know, hadn't quite come to the fore to become the other side of fantasy. But the, the other school of thought is that the, that fantasy actually as a self-conscious thing, you know, as a non-realistic thing, of course, begins with the advent of realism. So in the 19th century. So that's still a long time before Tolkien. Uh, I'm, I'm teach. I'm convening a whole course, a whole master's on fantasy here at the University of Glasgow. And I'm about to start teaching my first, you know, their first semester in a couple of weeks time. And all of the, you know, so we do a long history of fantasy. We do a whole survey, a whole year long survey of fantasy from the um, late 18th century to today. Well, the first semester ends with Tolkien. That's how much <laughs> before we go. So there's there's William Morris, there's George MacDonald, there's the people Tolkien was reading himself, right? So William Morris, George MacDonald, uh, Charles Kingsley, James Barry. You know, we we know he, he we know he saw one of the first performances of Peter Pan, which is like theatre fantasy, really. Um, there's Hope Merlis. We don't know if you ever read her, but you know, very very important people. Um, so no, he's he's not he's not the grandfather. I would say Morris and MacDonald are the grandfathers if you take the the short history of fantasy rather than the long one. But he did he, what, what Tolkien did was he he made fantasy into a it, it, into a genre that became marketable and distinct. You know, it was after Tolkien that it sits in the bookshops in a separate area. It's after Tolkien that the Ballantine adult fantasy series goes back and starts rediscovering people like William Morris and MacDonald and all of these. So, he, you know, there's a, there is a there is a paradigm shift, you know, something happens and the whole perception of the genre and its history changes. I have about 100 follow up questions that Ooh, I'm not stream. allowed to ask because this is an hour stream. It takes us a semester to answer those, though, just just to let you know. Of course, I realize that when we get this is an, a Tolkien overview. So when I when I announced this was an all about Tolkien, it is all about Tolkien, but uh, in yeah, headlines. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We should we should do another stream sometime about the uh, about the history of fantasy because I think sure, that would be really sure. interesting. Uh, the history of second worlds because that's that's where I get really yeah. Anyway, I the digress. History of world building is another whole area. You know, you because you can go into you can go into dystopias, you can go into Gallagher's troubles, you can go into yeah, absolutely. And, and where is it portal fantasy and where is it second world yeah, and yeah, how does it? Yeah. Oh man, yeah, Denise, sure. you, you and you and you and me are going to be friends. We're going to be okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about the world building, since we have broached that topic, the world building of Middle Earth, Arda, whatever you want to call it. How did Tolkien organize his world building? I ask this as somebody deeply invested in the answer. I don't think he ever did it consciously in a way that we think about it today, right? So we think about world building as a whole area of you know, as an academic, for me, it's a whole area of research. If you're a creative practitioner, it's a whole area of your creative practice, and you think about it quite systematically at times, or, or not. You know, again, this is a creative choice, right? How systematic you're going to be, or how fuzzy around the edges you're going to be. And I don't think Tolkien ever thought about it in those terms, because those terms weren't quite there. You know, he talked about primary versus secondary worlds. So he was he was conscious that this was another another world that he was creating, but not in terms of sort of subcategories or infrastructures or anything like that. For Tolkien, I would say the central elements in his world building were language. So we talked about invented languages that were absolutely in, in, in the center of everything. And the other was mythology. So uh, building upon the mythological texts that he knew really well from a number of actually um, cultures, mostly European cultures, let's be honest about this, you know, that's that's the, that's the stuff he knew best. So a lot of Anglo-Saxon sources, Norse sources, Celtic, Greek, um, so, some some um, um, sort of Indo -Europe, early European stuff as well, potentially. So that's the stuff that he's interested in. He There is, of course, the natural world that he was very interested in as, um, as a, you know, sort of self-taught botanist and naturalist, but that wasn't, you know, his main areas. Stuff came up, of course. Um, 
there wasn't as much, for example, in terms of thinking through economic systems or so, you know, how society works on, on that side of things. You know, th there were people asking him, writing letters, asking him questions about stuff after the Lord of the Rings. He was like, oh, I haven't thought about this bit. So, but that's normal. Again, you know, with world building, you'd expect some elements to be more developed than others. It depends on what, you know, you want the story to do, isn't it? So I'd say languages and mythology are the biggest, you know, the most fundamental ingredients, really, then were there right from the beginning. And there's a continuity all the way till the last few years before he died, because he kept on writing. You know, literally, we have, we, have, um, um, we have some of his writing from like two, three weeks before he died. Amazing. We call that the active world building area, by the way. Yes. It's like the bit where the story is happening. Um, I, again, because there is not, as far as we are aware, there's not a lot of like real practitioner centric terminology. We have had to invent a lot of terminology with of World course. Anvil. Um, because, yeah, anyway, anyway, I digress. What was the name of Tolkien's world? So a lot of people call it Middle Earth. A lot of people call the world the Lord of the Rings. Uh, which obviously is not correct. That is the name of the novels. Um, so what is the name and why is it called that? Well, the, the name is really Arda, which is the realm. It, it, you know, there's a lot of tautological <laughs> names in Tolkien. And Middle Earth is not Tolkien's term. You know, Middle Earth is the world among, you know, the outer seas, which is a very common medieval term to talk about the lived, the known world, shall we say, right? So Middle Earth is a section, of, you know, the, the, the big chunk of the world that we see in the Lord of the Rings map, but there is world around it, obviously, and there is Valinor on the other side, and, and there is Numenor, you know, well, there isn't anymore, but, you know, there, there are the, the islands on the other side. So there is a wider conception, and then there is where a lot of the action takes place. Yeah. Is, um, is Arda related to the Germanic Ard? Like Earth? No, it's it's one of his invented worlds. It, it words, sorry, not worlds at all. It's one of his invented worlds. Uh, words. It's Queenia for realm. So, hmm. um, okay, I, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of how the languages came about, but most of them do come from roots. So sometimes we hear we hear words that sound like another word that we might know in another language. The chances of that actually being meaningfully resonant are very very small because he's built that word based on something much much smaller before mm. and there's a whole line of succession in terms of words not right. that there aren't any there are some puns here and there but those ones he drew attention to so yeah fair did Tolkien create other worlds apart from Arda um that's an interesting one and there are different ways of answering so 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 there is sort of there are different versions of medieval England or medieval Europe that he's created with tales such as um, Smith Smith of Wooden Major or um, Farmer Giles of Ham, but but these tend to be sort of you know thinly disguised medieval or historical sort of um, yeah uh, realms. I think the interesting one here is the world, the parallel sort of Christmas world of the Father Christmas Letters, which is all in the North Pole, uh, where you know there is. Um, there is a parallel mythology which is very similar, actually, at points to the Middle Earth one. It just all is Christmassy, and it all it's all related to ice and polar bears and and gnomes and goblins instead of orcs and the man in the moon. Um, so it's 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 a fascinating it's a fascinating to read the Father Christmas letters and think about how letter by letter he's creating that other world that is a, a cut down version, a Christmas version of. Of Middle Earth um, to in many, whom, on many levels. To whom were these letters sent? Were they to children? Well, these were for his children. So he wrote them himself. Supposedly they were from Father Christmas, of course. So every Christmas morning they would find out. It's they're charming, absolutely beautiful. And he also drew quite a lot. So the world is realized visually because wow. the drawings that went with them. Um, yes. So every year he, they would receive a letter. And then uh, much, much later they, they were all published together as, you know, continuous narrative. And there is continuous narrative, you know, stuff happens from one year to the other. So, yeah, it's fascinating that because I don't think it was ever meant to be that. I think that the, the world building that he was doing on the, you know, in the big series project was sort of shaping what he was doing sort of, you know, on the side for his children without any conscious plan. So it's fascinating to see how the two talk, you know, are in dialogue with each other. Yeah. As uh, many world builders will tell you, uh, sometimes you create one world, you create another world and you go, oh, 
it's the same world. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, it it happens it happens more than you might imagine in the in the practitioner space as well, where you know even if it's not published as the same world, we still we still think there's connections there, and the way yeah. we shape this affects the way we shape that. So that is really nice to know. Tolkien had a human brain, built worlds like the rest of us. That that makes me feel. <laughs> So in World Anvil, we have something which we call the world building meta, which is a sort of breakdown. We call it the breakdown of the DNA of the setting. So it's sort of uh, the themes and the motifs and how those are realized, essentially. What would you say are the sort of most important things about Arda in terms of themes, motifs, the, the sort of the DNA of the setting? Wow. OK. Um big old question sorry it's a difficult one because it changed it changed through time it, it we're talking about a world that was developing in Tolkien's mind and in his writing and in his drawing and, he, and in his map make, making for six decades you know that's a long time 60 years is a long time so I'm trying to think of the through lines that sort of remain constant here because there are a lot that changed or went you know went out of the window so this whole I want to create a mythology for England thing. It definitely was an initial inspiration that dropped away and sort of wasn't as important to him later on for all sorts of historical reasons, I think. Um, one of them is loss, I think, and 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 um, loss of, you know, he, he's a, he was a medievalist, right? That was part of his, that was part of his bread and butter. And the, the bane of the medievalists' job is that um, you have texts that allude to other texts, you have stories that allude to other stories, which sound absolutely amazing, but those stories don't exist anymore because the manuscript is lost or, you know, nobody wrote it down, right? Yeah. So this sense of lost stories, of lost traditions, um, especially, you know, so, so combining both, you know, his day job, as I was saying, and this frustration of, you know, where is that stuff? And if it's not there, maybe I should make it up. In, but at the same time, also his generation's sense of real loss, you know, loss of life. You know, th this is somebody who um, became an orphan very, very young, uh, who went through a lot of trauma, then went to the First World War. Most of his friends died, you know, very few of them came back, you know, fortunately for us, Tolkien included, and went through, you know, trauma after trauma, like for, for a long time. So loss, melancholy, you know, the fact that we have... You know, we have the climax of the Lord of the Rings, and then you have the scaring of the Shire. And most readers, you know, the first time are like, "Why? Why are you doing this? You know, this, this. Why don't you leave it at the moment of triumph?" But this is not, you know, what Tolkien was about in many ways. So this sense of loss is important. Oral tradition as well. You know, the 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 the, the fact that there is value in both the written text, but also the oral uh, transmitting of stories, of ballads, of whatever. So the value value in traditional material is absolutely uh, key in Tolkien. And then there are the bigger themes like um, death and immortality. He talked a lot about that, not just, you know, when he was, as I said, a sort of middle-aged and later in life, but um, right from the beginning, that was a concern. You know, that he talked a lot about inventing the elves as an experiment of um, can, can I get to think about, can I get to think, as a character that doesn't die, how does that change? You know, and actually, what problems does that have? You know, what, what are the dilemmas there? And and again, think about how um, yes, some you know, there there is something reproachable about um, wanting deathlessness, right? And the elves are not necessarily happy with that. And the men who want it are usually, you know, well, they don't end up very well, do they? You know, thinking about Numenor and then you know what, what what we're about to see in the in the Amazon series. So death and immortality is, is a huge one as well. Um, war, you know, this is this is a man who lived through devastating um, the devastating First World War himself, and then saw his children going into the Second World War. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting lots of other things now, but you know, these are some of the things that stayed throughout throughout yeah. the legendary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, really, and uh, the. Uh, Honestly, I mean, I have a question later um, about why do you think the Lord of the Rings has remained such a popular book? And I think those, the fact that it's built on those themes is really one of the answers to that. You know, these are eternal themes. These are struggles that, you know, from caveman to, yeah. you know, this yeah, idiot behind it's, the computer it's, it's right universal here. universal human themes, Absolutely. aren't they? And, you know, that, that's where fantasy, I think, generally is at its best. It's where it... Um, it combines, you know, the the, the, the a, a different way of thinking about these 
about these thing, things rather than sort of try to do it by imitation, which is what realism does, which is sort of look at it from experience. And, and um, it, it's looking at some of those big metaphysical questions as well, you know, death and immortality. Gosh, you know, what other literary form dares to go there? You know, yeah. apart from that's the effect on the living. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked a lot about Tolkien himself and we've talked about, you know, Arda in general. But of course, my beans here uh, need to know more about history because they are building historical cultures themselves. <laughs> so in what ways is the history of Middle Earth important in Tolkien's stories? How does uh, how does that history manifest in the novels themselves? Mm -hmm. I think the best example here is The Lord of the Rings, and there's a number of instances where that happens. And one way is the landscape. So we see the hobbits, you know, and the whole company traversing a landscape where they see ruins all the time, ruins of previous civilizations, ruins of, you know, civilization, places that even, you know, Aragorn doesn't know what happened here. You know, we have we have the um, the Moranon and the uh, we have the wraiths. Um, a number of places where we see the material remains of previous cultures. But at the same time, you know, the elves are a bridge to that as well. So when in the Council of Elrond, um, Elrond talks about how, you know, he talks about the Last Alliance and where we ended, why we've ended up in the mess that we've ended up, why have we ended up with the ring still around? You know, why do we still have to do something about it? And he says, well, I remember the Last Alli Alliance of the elves and that. And Frodo turns around and says, you remember? You know, I thought that was thousands of years ago. It's like, yep, I was there. You know, I've seen a lot of fruitless victories. And, and, and you know, that that is not a gimmick. You know, that I think that's important. To, you know, this is not sort of um, creating um, a moment for effect and then you have to work backwards and create the backstory. This is, you know, when Tolkien wrote that scene, all of that backstory was there already, like a few decades before. And that really does show, you know, you... you you read the Lord of the Rings and you do get a sense of historical depth. Yeah, absolutely. How do you think he's created that from a, like how might a, how might a world builder emulate that uh, or a novelist yeah. emulate that when they're creating their own secondary worlds? Yeah. Um, the, the, it's difficult to do it the way Tolkien did it because it takes a long time, right? So one way is to, to do that. So you keep on working and developing and working and developing. And, you know, you've got a situation where somebody hasn't published anything for three te decades and then suddenly a piece of work comes and it's got all of that sort of, all of that history written down, really, but just not, not out there. The other ways, again, Tolkien used that as well, is, you know, there is there is a particular um, cultural textual moment that you're using that has resonances and you're trying to do something with it in the text, but then you integrate that with the rest of the world and the, the philosophy of that world. So one thing that I think Tolkien did not expect, and he said actually that, that idea just came up, I have no idea where it came up from, are the ends. So he, it, there, there was no backstory for the ends. There was no backstory for the writers of Rohan. You know, there, there are a number of things actually where backstories did not exist because they came up in the writing and some of them came up. I think, you know, with the ends, it's very, it's very obvious um, to say that, you know, his own love of trees, you know, he's, he talks about that a lot, especially in later life interviews. He's sort of uh, filling this report with trees and imagining how would it be to be, how, what would happen if I could speak to a tree, you know, that wish fulfillment is coming through there. And, and with the writers of Rohan, I mean, the, the, the scene where the company um, approaches Edoras and they walk, you know, they have to disarm and they have to walk in, it's it's point by point um, retelling the Beowulf, the Beowulf scenes, right? Where Beowulf and his company come in and they have to disarm and then they have to meet the king. And it's just point, you know, you can really do a diagram. We do that in classroom with, with my students. Um, and that's a text he was like teaching every day, right? That's a text he knew yeah. nearly by heart. And what what you what he did with those in those cases is that he worked backwards, you know, as 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 you as you I'm sure many practitioners uh, in this in this audience will have done, and it's about finding ways to to make it feel natural. But also, it's all as I was saying before, these bits that he added that he hadn't planned for were bits that he either felt very very strongly about or that he knew really really well, and that again gives you that you know that um, anchoring to go back and do do the retrofitting work, yeah. which which has to be done at, at that particular point. I have a question about the Ents that is not yes. on my list, but I'm burning down. That's fine. Um, 
there is something that I have read about the parallels between Macbeth and the Lord yes. of the Rings, and particularly the Burnham Wood shall come to Dunsinane yep. prophecy, yes. and tied in, of course, to the uh, cannot be killed by um, cannot be killed by a, a, a man, man of woman of born. Woman. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, sure. Which of no, course he flips on his head to be a woman rather than a exactly. man born by exactly. cesarean. No, this this is pretty. Again, this is a pretty obvious parallel there. And he again, it's one of the Tolkien wasn't very good at acknowledging sources. He was quite quite reluctant to say, "Yeah, I got this from there." So we only have a couple of bits and pieces where he actually says that's where that came from. But the Macbeth link has been made quite specifically. He said, "You know, part of part of." Um, Especially the the battle, you know, the fact the fact that the trees go to war was for him a response to um, to Shakespeare to, to um yeah to Shakespeare who he thought made a shabby use of it because there weren't <laughs> real trees going to war there were just shoulders you know masquerading as trees holding branches etc and he was thinking like what, trees. You know, what a shame why not have real trees do it um, there are other precedents you know there is the battle of the trees in um, in um, medieval Welsh material which he he knew as well so this is not a completely new idea. You know, the the uh, this is a I think 12th, 13th century text in which a magician Gwydion um sends the trees to war and each tree is described, you know, in warrior terms and they do march. So th there are, you know, there are other precedents there as well. But yeah, the Macbeth link is one that he he did talk about actually. I've got to start reading more early Welsh literature. That sounds <laughs> sounds amazing. Um so we've talked a little bit about how Tolkien's drawn inspiration from literature itself how did Tolkien draw inspiration from real world history for the history mm. of Middle Earth and where mm. do we see those influences manifested okay um this is another so, another so hour lecture I think it is it is and it, it is and it isn't in some ways you know I've already sort of started touching on that when I talked about Beowulf and the Anglo-Saxon culture right so Beowulf is a text Beowulf yeah. is a literary is is a construct is a little it's a it's, it's a little it's a poem it's an epic yeah. But at the same time, the way that he, that Tolkien is constructing the culture of the writers of Rohan is very much based on what was known at the time about how the Anglo-Saxons lived. You know, the hall is is um, described in a particular way. Um, the you know the the way that they interact, the names, you know, everything uh, around their names and language is is old English. So the material culture. The linguistic, you know, everything gravitates towards that historical moment where you know the Anglo-Saxons lived, the, the the and the Old English language was was spoken, and you could say uh, you could see elements of that in other places in Middle Earth as well. So he talked about Gondor as uh, either you know Constantinople or Venice or um, Egypt. So he's definitely thinking about more of a sort of Eastern. Um, Eastern flavor there potentially. He he was quite the, the Egypt one is an interesting one because the the Numenorians and the Gondorians seem to be quite interested in big tombs and sort of embalming. Ah, okay. That is you know that that culture of um, yeah again. being a bit obsessed with death. I that think, theme of death again is coming back in. He's something that he he's uh, he, he he seems to have blended there. But then if you go back to the Numenorians before the point that they're corrupt, they are more like the Vikings, they're seafarers, you know, they're, they're out there sort of conquering. And they're a bit of the British Empire sort of as well. So that that's that's what's fascinating there, that they're not always consistent, those things. Um, so, you know, in, in, in the Middle Earth around the Third Age where the Lord of the Rings is happening, you have Anglo-Saxon sort of culture in the writers of Robert, a mix of Egypt and, you know, Vikings and um, um, Venice and Constantinople in Gonda, and a Warwickshire, you know, village of the, you know, of the of Victorian, Victorian era. In the Shire. But you know, it all still fits. You know, it all still works. And it's only if you, you know, I use with my students. I talk about this um, parallel of the um, an embroidery, right? You see the embroidery, and you see the you see the um, the pattern. If you turn it around, you see all the knots and all the mess, you know, that make the embroidery re look really good. So if you start like, looking into it, it is a mess. You know, it, it, it shouldn't fit together, but it does fit together. Yeah. Um, you know, you could talk also about the, um, the um, come on, oh, it's gone off my head, where um, Frodo and Sam and Gollum are walking through the marshes, the dead marshes, uh, the dead yeah. marshes, the dead marshes are the song. You know, this is so much, you know, his experience of the dead bodies rotting in the First World War, you know, people he knew, you know, and also, you know, he talks about friends and foes together, that he saw, you know, he witnessed with his own eyes. So um, 
yeah, it's a mismatch. Of, if we take the Bakhtin's term, you know, the chronotope, that each text has a, a time and a space and those fit together. Well, Middle Earth shouldn't, you know, it, 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 you know, if you think about it sort of analytically, all of these times and places sh shouldn't fit together. Yeah. But they do. But they I do. love so that. We're in an other world. I love that example of the embroidery where, you know, the back might be a mess, but the resultant pattern, that's what we call it in music anyway, the resultant pattern on the that's front is, is beautiful and technicolored and it, it works. It's harmonious. Sure. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a very good metaphor for writing. It's a, <laughs> it's a metaphor for writing I've seen before as well, but I think you're absolutely right for, for inspiration and world building, like those things, pulling, pulling together all these disparate elements and, and creating them like that. Absolutely. Um, so I we've heard a lot about Tolkien and we've heard a lot about the history of Tolkien. Do you have a favorite moment in the history of Middle Earth, a favorite story? Oh wow, um way too many and it changes it changes at different times. I think at the moment I'm quite I mean I love the early stuff. I really like the the Book of Lost Tales, which most people think it's a bit weird and as I said whimsical and but that's the first, how can I say that? It's the first springing of his creativity. So you see the juices are flowing everywhere. You know, there's all of these different ideas and some of them he follows through and some of them he doesn't. And there's little stories where he's like, I'm going to write this later and he never does. And, you know, there's the frustration of the Tolkien scholar. Now you see that, um, yeah, that burst of energy that you don't quite get later on. You know, he uh, later on he's working towards making all of that work and fit. Right. So that excitement of the beginning, I always find fascinating. At the moment, I'm reading quite a lot um, and rereading the more, you know, I, I love the, the story of Aldarion and Arendis. I, it's 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 very it's very bitter. <laughs> it's not a very nice read. It's, you know, they're both quite awful you know, to each other. But this is, you know, this is one of those stories where, you know, you have a very strong female character with very, very strong agency. Uh, and you have an argument um, against sort of toxic masculinity, really, in many ways. And also, uh, you know, where all of that can go, can go the other way and can go wrong. You know, a lot about, you know, women tied in childbirth, a lot of the stuff that, you know, you think is not quite Tolkien's domain. But, you know, in that story, it's all coming through. That's really interesting to hear that he really sort of, you know, explored in, in other spaces what you don't see in the main novels. So how about you? When did you first encounter... Tolkien's books and was it love I've at told first this sight? story way too many times but I'll, I'll tell sorry you. no no that's fine I, I mean I always get asked that um I, I'm, I'm from Greece as most people will realize with a name like this uh and I was doing my undergraduate at the University of Athens back in you don't want to know when a long time ago, a very long time ago um and I just stumbled upon the Lord of the Rings in a you know summer trip with students um in, in the UK and I just brought it back and I just read the first book straight away in English actually which I think is a blessing looking back now you know I read it in the original and you so you sort of fall into the world you know as, as many of you will have experienced with this book and I think my first ha having been brought up you know with I, I was completely obsessed with classical mythology when I was younger completely you know I knew all of the gods all of them all of them nymphs all of the you know, all of the variations all of the different versions of each story etc uh and what I was seeing in Tolkien was wow a man and one person has created a world that is rich enough to sort of emulate that sort of complexity and that, I, th I think that's where my first research questions came from so yeah it, it was a chance meeting but yeah very very um good luck I suppose that's so nice um I will tell this story uh guys uh who are listening please feel free to reflect on your own time that you first read Tolkien but uh for me I was supposed to be um revising I completely forgot the word I was supposed to be revising for my GCSEs and uh, I was like, well, I don't want to do that. So I will pick up this giant book and start reading it instead. <laughs> and I sat on the floor of my dorm room and I opened up this book and it was like there was a vacuum between my brain and the page. And I was just sucked yeah. in. I felt this electricity between the, my hands holding and, you know, I had my back pressed up on the floor against my desk and I just could not put the book down. And I had never had an experience like that. I avid reader, but um, 
I got straight A stars in my exam, so clearly it did me good. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, mind in other ways. I'm, exactly. I'm not surprised at that. You know, that's I, I, I have taught talking for many years, and that's all. That's always something that you start the conversation with, and th there seems to be that sort of um, yeah, that, that sort of mesmerizing effect that the text has. Um, and 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 I think a, a lot of the power of that is that the world was there already you know that and and and, and I'm, I'm i'm again i'm not saying that this is impossible in a debut novel but you have to put the work in you know you have to put the work in to really really make it believable to really make it well realized guys you heard it here first dr <laughs> Fema says you have to go world build it will make your novel better um <laughs> so moving swiftly on from that what do you think is the most misunderstood thing about tolkien's world and work because there's there's so much yeah. you know mythos surrounding the world. It's been around so long. It's been so many different interpretations and readings, and you know every book is new to it. It's every reader. So sure. yeah, what what is? Sure. I mean, there's lots of pet peeves I could go. On. Uh, one of them is um, it all started with language, and just Tolkien was invented languages in the void. And he wanted people to speak the languages, so he started creating the characters and the stories to speak them. That's not true. Um, it, it, the languages, the, he was creating languages separately from the stories. He was also creating stories separate from the languages, and these things started as sort of slightly separate things. But they came together very early, and he talks a lot in his letters about how these two creative practices, you know, those two aspects of his creativity got joined together and never quite separated again. So... Yeah, the languages at times drove the stories, but also the stories drove the languages as well. So this sort of one way thing that the languages existed well developed and then the stories came to dress them up is just not not right. So that's one thing. It, it is a very complex relationship between the two. <clears throat> the other one is, uh, which is doing the rounds at the moment because of the Amazon series, is the whole question of, but Tolkien was writing a mythology for England. So, you know, of course, it's not going to be a diverse world and all of this argument. Um, and again, that is complicated. He definitely started with the intention to create a mythology for England. Um, and again, in my in my audible course, I go into the whole context of why, you know, was he mad to try to do that? Actually, no, lots of other people were doing that for other countries at that particular time. It was completely fitting with his period. Uh, but also he knew within a couple of, you know, within a decade or so that this was way too ambitious. It was never going to work for all sorts of reasons. And the, and the whole project became something different, became something much more universal. That's why we're still reading it now, right? If if, if uh, it was a mythology for England, it'd probably have been forgotten somewhere in, you know, in some drawer at the moment. Um, so that that is another important one, I think, that there was, yeah, that was the original impetus or one of the original inspirations uh, or ideas, you know, as a, as, a, as a project there, but it didn't last very long, especially after a lot of, you know, trauma, as I was saying before, the First World War, all of these big ambitious ideas went out of the window, not just for Tolkien, but for many other people as well. So remembering that, um, and the, the, I suppose the bigger one that unites both of these things is, um, it, 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 it is very common to judge all of Tolkien based on the late Tolkien. So the stuff he said in his interviews, the stuff we've got videos of him talking, the letters, etc. But that's like the last half of his creativity. All of the first half is not as documented, but it was absolutely crucial in his development as well. And his ideas changed through time. You know, six decades. You know, think about where did you think the same stuff? You know, take ten years ago that that that, that you think now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all we need is Facebook to remind us what stupid things we were saying oh, five yes. years ago, right? Like, sure, <laughs> sure. So you've touched on something there that I did want to discuss and. I did clear this with Dimitra in advance. I am not, I am not springing anything on her. But there have been some uncomfortable racial allegations made about some of the non-human species in Middle Earth and their origins. What is your opinion about that? Well, I wrote about this back in two thousand. You know, I've been writing about this since two thousand five, wow. and my first book has a whole section on that. My first book was published in two thousand eight. Yeah. So, you know, when I hear sometimes, oh, suddenly people are talking about this. Like, yes, the scholarship has been talking about this for a long, long time, I can assure you. Yeah, there are, of course, there are problematic elements. And that's the stuff I was picking up uh, back then. And I've been working on and discussing for a long time. Remember that cultural context we talked about at the beginning? You know, Tolton is a late Victorian 
child, you know, and, and the way that our childhood shapes some of our thinking, you know, if you think about sort of developmental psychology, et cetera, it's absolutely key. You know, it does shape a lot of a lot of us, not all of us, you know, we can still change, but it does have a huge effect. And and this is the time of, you know, the the, the zenith of British imperialism. And this is, you know, if, if you think about other, you know, other writers at the time and how they're looking at or how, how they're yeah, how they're portraying non-white um peoples, you know, this whole colonizer, colonized sort of discourse that we see in Arthur Conan Doyle or, you know, um later writers, etc. That's the milieu that he's, you know, that's the stuff he was reading, that's the stuff, he, you know, that's how he was he grew up. And there's actually pretty objectionable stuff that he wrote as a very young man, which is very rarely quoted because people don't know about it. Much, much worse than what we think, you know, is in is in the Lord of the Rings. So yes, yeah, sure. The, the, I think the major issue there is that there is an automatic um, equation of you know anybody in uh, populations that are generally white are on the side of good. Populations that are generally non-white are generally on the side of evil. Right? There will be exceptions on both sides, but this sort of wider because um, you do get you do get non-white people in Tolkien, but they're not very nice usually. You know they tend to be where you know on the side where they shouldn't be. So there is this sort of um, association of physical characteristics with moral and mental um abilities and 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 yeah and, and and associations and that's what racism is really isn't it you know racism is exactly associating skin color or other physical characteristics with mental or moral um elements so that that is there um at times it's unconscious i'm pretty sure at other times mm, you know you're just thinking come on now you could have fixed that right um, but at the same time, it, it's fascinating because we have also a man who lived through the Second World War who was very aware of what was going on, you know, with with, um, with the rise of Nazism, for example. You know, he was asked um, to declare Aryan orangi- origin when uh, they wanted the Germ- a German firm wanted to translate The Hobbit. And he said, no, I'm not doing that. And if you ask me if I'm not Jewish, I'll tell you that I'm, I'm very sorry not to be. So, you know, he, he took the right stance in real life when it mattered for real peoples. But when writing fiction, I suppose that's not quite re- real. Is it? You know, there, there is a distinction there between, yeah, taking take a st- stance where it matters in the real world versus some of those older ideas are definitely still seeping through his work, whether he means it or not. Is a, is a, yeah, it's a big discussion. And at times, I think, I think at times he, especially in later writings, he was more conscious of prejudice, for example. So there's, um, the, there are later texts where he's talking about how you know, the different hierarchies of the elves, how the high elves are looking down upon the cinder elves and they're using sort of derogatory language about them. So he's starting tuning into the discussions of the time. So it's complex, you know, it's not black and white. They're definitely problematic bits. Um, Was he aware of some of them? That's more difficult. That's more difficult to know. Uh, um, Again, I don't think that's an excuse because people at his time were were raising these things. Um, Yeah, it's complex. It's complex. No, absolutely, of course, of course. And again, when you, I mean, we have this conversation with Wagner, we have this conversation. Oh, sure. with, um, Lovecraft is another great example where we're like, love, right. love, love is work, hate the guy. Um, yeah. And, and you know, know, Tolkien I mean, is not like... so extreme as that. No, but... no. And, and again, I suppose that that these sorts of things go back longer. You know, we're talking about uh, how much um, uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's work is shaped by anti-Semitism, for example, yeah. you know, or, or how all of medieval literature is shaped by, you know, the, the you know, this idea of the, the non-white as being, you know, the evil other, etc. There's there's a long tradition of those things. Um, it, it's, I suppose, it's, the, the, the difficulty there is that we have somebody who did live through the Second World War and who was aware of these discussions, and at times he's responding to them, and at times it seems like some things are slipping through the net. Yeah, which is very, very interesting. Um, again, I think there's a whole a whole semi- the, the series of seminars to be had on this. It's a it's a very deep and complex topic. But but thank you for sort of boiling that down for us. I realise it's it's difficult when you're so into a topic to to really sort of just take it. There are there are some resources on my website about that because people have been you know as, as I'm sure you, you as I'm sure you realise you know with with the Amazon series and all the all the um, backlash um, with the diverse casting that question has come up again and again and again I'm sort of getting media requests all the time so on my website I've got links uh, 
to shorter articles and longer articles that are free to access so that you know this is important stuff that people need to know what's what's going on so that brings me to what is your opinion on Anvisons? rings of power what are your uh, thoughts it's too early to say so I've, I've been watching it obviously i've been watching it um i've only you know we've only got up to episode three goodness knows you know where where they're going with some of the storylines so i am i am I'm, I'm, i've been commissioned to review it by a national um newspaper so i'm you know i'm gonna have, have to reserve judgment on that what i'll say is interesting bits some annoying bits um I think the bit I like the most at the moment is the the world, how, how the world is being expanded and how locations and landscapes of Middle Earth that I never thought I would see are being realised. Uh, some of the acting is is superb. Some other I'm not quite sure. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I think it's going to be a difficult one. As I said, I've been commissioned to do a review after the fourth episode, and I think that's still going to be a lot of things will have been unresolved in terms of storyline. So yeah. I'll do the best I can, I suppose. But amazing um okay so since we're on the topic lord of the rings book versus movie which movie Ooh, i was thinking the the big three the the, okay. the most well-known ones okay okay um and book versus movie in terms of what what are your your thoughts about you know how they compare i mean okay. again this is a whole yeah. this is a whole you know media discussion but you know sure sure um I thought I thought that it was a good go at, 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 at adapting the Lord of the Rings. I liked the first movie more than the other two. I think the the action took over a lot of the more subtle bits you know, of the of the second and the third uh, books. And also, um, I, I think the first book is more linear, right? So the first book out of the three is you know you follow the same people all the way through. With the second and the third book, you start having this bifurcation. So one lot go and do this thing, the other lot go and do the other thing. You know, the, the fellowship is sort of um, separated. And what Tolkien does masterfully, and again, I discussed this in the Audible course, is he does this very medieval romance sort of interlace thing where the story moves a little bit forward and a little bit, and then you back to the other bit and you're like maybe two days before. So they, you know, you don't know what's happened in between. And there's all of this sort of, very complex chronology there that actually I think in, in many ways replicates funnily enough reality in the sense that you know you're here you don't know what other people are doing over there right so it gives you that sense of limited perspective the film can't do that the film has to give you a linear narrative right so a lot of these things have been flattened out which I suppose is 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 unavoidable with a medium like this um but it is you know it, it is what it is it does it does detract a bit from the complexity of the text um, bits that I liked a lot again was the 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 world building, the settings. You know, they had amazing people involved, as as the Amazon series does. You know, Alan Lee and John Howe. You can see their you know because their art was there long before, long before the films. Um, I was a bit annoyed that some, and I see the legacy of that now. Is some tropes started getting introduced that now everybody's is reusing. I the, the dwarves are the comic sidekick. That's not what they are in in yeah. in Tolkien's world. They're they're much more. They can be quite dangerous, actually. They can, oh, yeah. can be quite, yeah. Uh, or um, you know, the relationship between Sam and Frodo is more. I mean, it's, Sam at times is portrayed as a, a bit of a simpleton, and I. That's not what he is. Again, it, it, it's more complex than that uh, in the book. Um, so yeah, again, you know, a, a mix really, a mix, but. It, it, it was a fair attempt, you know, it was a really, really good try. Um, and, and I understand the fact that, you know, you, you have to have, you know, you have to have drama and you have to have, um, you have to have moments of tension that then get resolved, which is doesn't always follow the book. But, you know, cinematic storytelling is a different, is a different animal to, to narrative storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. I was very glad to see that they expanded some of the female roles in the in the movie. Yes, because, I mean, and, that, and the characters felt more three dimensional. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, that is another big issue, and and you know that's that's an um, um, if you remember the Hobbit films, right? And 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 they compare which oh, wow, which yeah. I thought were interesting, but um, I mean, how how do you how do you make three films out of a tiny book like this? It was a fantasy on a theme of the Hobbit, really, wasn't you, it? it? You was... make lots of stuff up. You know, you keep the central storyline, but you make up stuff. But the one thing that I sort of was 
less worried about compared to other of my colleagues or actually fans was um was Tauriel there because you have you know you have the whole of the Hobbit and there's no female characters not one and you have a 21st century film how the heck you know can you do this you can't it, it's just not it's it not should possible. pass the Be- the Bechdel test like it's not so, a yeah of course of course they had to give uh female characters more of a role and that's the same with Peter, with Peter Jackson's uh Lord of the Rings films um if that, that's you know, again, that's one of those issues that the, the texts have to be sort of, uh, when they are adapted, there has to be that reparative um, element there. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you have an unbalanced an unbalanced storyline in a 21st century context, which just is never going to work. Do you see that being the same in the Rings of Power with the with the more diverse characters? Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the picked Galadriel as the, one of the main sort of folk, focal um, characters for a reason. You know, and, and again, we hear a lot more about her in um, well, in the appendices, of course, but mostly in, in the uh, Unfinished Tales. You know, the, she was a much, much more, you know, um, active character and she was much more rebellious and irreverent <laughs> you do all sorts of things that you know you read about Galadriel and Lord of the Rings and then you read and finish them it's like are these the same people is that the same person really so yeah of course of course they've latched on to onto this and I, I completely understand that yeah well Dimitra I could ask you questions for another five hours you are fascinating you're a wonderful <laughs> wonderful person to talk to and thank you so much for sharing your expertise i should share with you the questions from our chat we have just a couple that have come in um clock Wocket asks essentially do you think it's important to read the silmarillion before you read the lord of the rings do you think it gives you a better experience Whew, that's an interesting one um no Probably not. I mean, again, this is this is objective, right? And I might change my mind in in a few years' time. At the, I would think not in the sense that the Silmarillion we have is a late text, right? So the Silmarillion was published as as um, as I'm sure the audience here knows posthumously. Tolkien never finished it to his own satisfaction. So Christopher Tolkien had to put together the texts. He had to select versions of texts because all of these stories we have in the Silmarillion there were tons of different versions of each of them. And he erred towards the later one, so the post-Lord of the Rings versions. Um, so this is a mature work and a late conception that takes into account in some ways uh, the Lord of the Rings. Not throughout, because some some stories were never revised later. So, you know, and he had sort of regular, regularized names, et cetera. But it is a late conception. Um, I think the Lord of the Rings stands absolutely fine on its own. And then um, it makes it easier than to read the Silmarillion, which, let's face it, is not an easy book to go through. You know, there is no mediation. There are no hobbits who are a bit like us, right, in a medieval yeah. context. The They've hobbits got that every man feel where you can exactly. have that audience have a very good experience. You have yeah. something to relate to. With the, with the Silmarillion, it's like the Bible of the elves, right? And in the beginning was the It's really, really, you know, and, and the rhetoric of it and, and the lists of names and the, and the stories are condensed, you know, the summaries of what all and would hope then would become individual stories. So it is a tough read, the Silmarillion. I think I think actually it's the other way around. It's reading the Silmarillion after is going to actually make the Silmarillion much more relatable and much more easy to go through. I'm going to make an, uh, an admission here on live stream, guys. Bear witness. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I am a published fantasy author. I am a published RPG writer. I never read the Silmarillion all the way through. <laughs> I started it. I went... Ah, oh, the lists! <laughs> I read the Bible all the way through, cover to cover, to find out why everybody was killing each other for this book. I could not make it through the Silmarillion. It's tough. It's really it, tough. It's yeah. really tough. And and I think, you know, that's another question I'm asked at times, is why did Tolkien never finish it? I think there are some interesting ideas there. I think, at, you know, I think the, the, the construction of the world had got so complicated at that point that to make it all fit he just didn't have enough time you know he'd need another lifetime to make it work and again you know what we get in the Silmarillion is slightly put together you know as as best as possible but as you say it's not an it's not an easy read and it's not it doesn't flow yeah um the other reason I think he didn't was because there was this tension between do I really want to get this out there now will that take away from the sense of depth that the Lord of the Rings has. You know, he says in one of his letters, 
the whole point, you know, the whole uh, charm of the Lord of the Rings is that you can feel these stories in the background. To go there is to destroy the magic. So th there were tensions there, for sure. There were tensions there. And also the thread, there were too many threads. Talking about, you know, embroideries, said too many threads. He just couldn't couldn't fit them together anymore, I think, by the end. I will say Tolkien needed a world anvil. I, I, yes. That's all I can say. He bit needed... of systematizing wouldn't be a bad thing. Bit of organizing, a little bit of, <laughs> little bit of, you know, motivation from the community to get his world building finished what can i say sure. so where did the hobbits come from asks rpg dinosaur bob where did the hobbits come from right all sorts of different things so the hobbits are it's interesting so i gave a lecture at the university of birmingham an invited lecture um last may and my topic was tolkien's published interviews so the stuff he told journalists um in the last couple of decades of his life he kept on coming back to the hobbits as his memories of the what he called the rustic people around Birmingham uh, in the Midlands, you know, where he, he grew up as a child and their ways and their talk and their accents and the way they, you know, they wear around their environment. To remember this distinction between, you know, Tolkien, he, he was, you know, he was, the, the, the family had lost its fortune. You know, the mother, the mother was so, so not quite destitute, but they weren't, in, you know, they weren't financially in very good in a very good place, but he came from a middle class background. The hobbits are the working classes sort of um, rural population as he saw it at the time, which he saw as distinct to himself, but he also felt that he admired their connection to the land, their connection to storytelling, all of these things. It's, it's, it's a very romantic view of the Midlands at the end of the 19th century and the, the early 20th century. How old was Tolkien when he moved from South Africa to England? Oh, with the four? No, sorry, no. Yeah, four. It, it was he even four. I'm just trying to remember the exact date. He, he was he was very very small. You know, he yeah. very he had very few memories. So again, in these interviews, he talks about what he remembered out of of um, the Orange Free State, which is now in, in South Africa, and he remembers sort of. Um, having a eucalypt, wilting eucalyptus for a Christmas tree, or he remembers the sand, he remembers the heat, but that's it. You know, he just have very vague images. It, he was very, very young. Yeah, I so was asking. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So when he comes back, no, it's a good question. But when he comes back, he he feels like he's coming to another world in some ways. You know, England for him is another world. You know, it's it's. but at the same time, it's his world. It's where his parents came from. You know, there's this double sort of thing of, I belong here, but this is all new. So th there's a lot of that um, enchantment that I think goes straight into the Shire. That's what, because again, as a as a child of many cultures, I'm a as many of you know, I'm a filthy mongrel, um, and uh, yeah, as somebody who who you know straddles various cultures, it's 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 one of the ways to process what you're seeing and yeah. what's what's happening there. I mean, Dimitra, you've lived in many places as well, so you might have experienced this too sure, but sure. yeah it, it's it, the it's familiar that, it's, yet not familiar that's it exactly it's the experience of the immigrant child isn't it exactly that the sort of i know this place but i don't know this place and it's yeah. that i belong and i don't belong and i can see it with external eyes but it's also part of me and all of that feeds into into the shire yeah absolutely um we have a question here that i definitely do not know the answer to from not dun manifested who asks where did goldberry come from Ooh. Wife of my least favorite character, by the way. Least favorite character in uh, Lord of the Rings. Tom Is Bombadil. that Tom Bombadil? Poor thing. <laughs> Nobody like. Why? 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 Tom Bombadil straight. Um, so Goldberry and Tom Bombadil existed before the Lord of the Rings. There are a number of poems about them. How oh, you know uh, Tom Bombadil and the Riva daughter, and then she's named Goldberry. Some of those poems actually were later published in um, uh, the Adventures of Tom Bombadil and other verses from the Red Book. Uh, but they were written long before the Lord of the Rings. Um, and in some ways, Tom Bombadil is a is a representation of the Oxfordshire, again, rural landscape. He's a genius Lockheye. He, he's, you know, the, the spirit of the of the land, the spirit of the landscape. And Goldbury's he's he's his consort. She's the he, she's a representation of the river. Um, and there are different different ways of reading her. So different scholars have talked about her as um very similar to some of the sort of female water deities that you see in 19th century fantasy. You know, you see you see characters like her in George MacDonald's um, novels, for example. Um, you know, she's been linked to Undine in you know in the Germanic tradition. Um, 
And I think that, that, that Tolkien was a great recycler. I've said that before, you know, that's a term I've used before, but he was great at recycling stuff he's, he's done before, right? Absolutely brilliant. And that again, that connection and that sort of sense of depth comes in there as well. So he had all of these stories ready to hand. He clearly had no idea where he was going when he was writing. I mean, again, I tell my students, my students say, why is it so difficult to read the first part of the first book? And then you get to the Council of Elrond and it all flows. Yeah. And the answer is, because he had no idea what he was doing. He, he didn't know where the plot was going. If you see the, the drafts for this, you know, he's published The Hobbit. His publishers say, lovely, that's done really well. And just, you know, what else do you have? They said, there's the Silmarillion, as it was back then, not the version we've got now. Um, they say, no, it's a bit dark, a bit, I'm not, not sure about that. Can you write something else about Hobbits? And uh, Tom was like at the beginning, no, I don't have anything else to say about Hobbits. I've said everything I wanted to say about Hobbits. I want the mythology out. You know, I want the world building I've been doing all this time. Um, but, you know, clearly he realizes this ain't going to happen. So he reluctantly starts writing The Lord of the Rings. And he has no plan, you know, until he writes, suddenly realizes that that ring that Bilbo has, oh, I can do something with this. And then it all gets, as I said, it really gets going after that Council of Elrond. And then he had to go and rewrite everything, of course. But he kept that rumbling opening where they stop here and they stop there. And there's things that never come back to, to have, you know, particular impact on the story. And that's the stuff that most adaptations cut out for obvious reasons. So that's that's what happens there is that there are characters that he's been working with and playing around for a long time. And he's bringing them in as a way to push him forward in the story. Yeah, which, again... That's what we do as writers. I'm when we sure get stuck, that, yeah. we go I've back to the world building and we say, that. wait, <laughs> what did I have in my box for this moment? Exactly. What could I what tool can I bring out? What what you know, yeah. piece of piece of idea do I have yeah. lurking? Um, I think that is a great place to to leave this interview for today. With the final question. Why didn't the eagles fly the ring to Mordor, Demetria? Oh, come on. <laughs> I had to. I'm so sorry. It is, it is one of the right. stupidest okay. well, questions. I had to ask you at least one stupid question. Once and for all, right. Um, Tolkien is definitely ahead of his time in terms of eco-critical thinking, right? He's definitely thinking in environmental terms in a way that most of us didn't think until the 70s, right? So that nature has a life and an existence and an intricate value of its own. It's not here to serve us. It's not here, you know, for us to use it or exploit it in any way. And actually, in some ways, it's going to stay here long after, we, you know, we've gone from the, from from existence. And and the eagles have their own stuff to deal with. You know, they're, they're, it's not their job to go and solve, you know, people's problems you know that think about also again Bombadil you know that that's you know we just brought him up a, a minute ago he's got his own stuff to look after he's not he could potentially say why don't you take the ring why why couldn't he go and do something because that's not what he does you know he's not concerned with a you know in the what in the grand scheme of things is one battle and one storyline in a much much bigger world so yeah the, the eagles you know will potentially you know sort of take part where they happen to be there they happen to see something and it fits with what they want to do but just like the trees have their own priorities and their own issues the eagles do too you know they're, they're not there to be used in that way a very sensible answer to a very <laughs> silly question thank you Dimitra <laughs> <laughs> well if you want to learn more because Dimitra is one of the most fascinating guests we have ever had on this podcast to date, then you can go and take her course. Dimitra, tell me a little bit about your course. Yeah, the, the Audible that. course is, um, it's part of the great courses, which people in the States probably will know better. Um, it, uh, it is uh, 10 lectures and it looks at uh, different aspects of Tolkien's creativity. So we're looking at... Um, I'm looking at sort of have a lecture on the biography and actually how the different versions of his mythology changed throughout his life. So, you know, more detail than what we could cover today. Um, there is one on the mythology for England, one on the elves, uh, quite a lot on how Tolkien reshaped mythological material. Um, there's one on languages. I do speak in Queenia, <laughs> so if you want to know how it sounds, um, that's that's a good one. Um, there is one on theology as well, and on his, you know, the, the, the idea of eucatastrophe and the more philosophical sort of platonic ideas in, in Tolkien. Uh, and uh, I end with, you know, evil and war and trauma in Middle Earth with uh, gen gender and race, as I was saying before, and then uh, a last lecture on receptions and legacy. So, you know, what was Tolkien's effect in other writers, but also some, uh, you know, the adaptations 
and the art and all of that uh, up until you know the point of recording obviously um so yeah and and on my website for every lecture because again those lectures are about half an hour each um so for each lecture I have extra resources and these are all uh, resources that are free to access so people can um you know read further um into all of these things Amazing. And folks, I've just dropped the link for Dimitra's uh, website, which is helpelly dimitrafimi.com, yes. on to the chat. So go and check that out. If you're listening post facto, you will find it down in the notes underneath. And uh, yeah, you can find some free resources there and learn more about Dimitra and her books and her amazing scholarship. Dimitra, thank you so, so very much for joining us here today. It's been great fun. Thank you all very much. And thank you for the good questions. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, we will be live tomorrow with a writing stream for our On the Shoulders of Giants challenge where you guys can write along with writing sprints. You can ask questions, you can pull inspiration and generally get yourselves ready for the challenge and add a whole new dimension to your worlds. I'm excited to see them. I'm excited to learn the winners as well. But guys, you've got to get writing. OK, you don't have long to get those in. We are going on a raid. Our raid shout is light up the forge and we are raiding the Rookery Publications where they are talking about the rise of machine and discussing AI art with Mark Gibbons, Andy Law, Lindsay Law and Andy Leesk. I am very excited about this. AI image generation is a huge dividing thing in our space right now. So if you have missed it, you must go and check this out. Very, very interesting implications for creativity for the future of our industry in fact. So uh, yeah, uh, stick around and uh, earn some extra ample points as well when you do. Guys, I'll see some of you tomorrow. And in the meantime, grab your hammer and go world build. <laughs>